Today on Things I Found Online, we explain mansplaining and then men correct us. What is mansplaining? Why is it happening? Is it really happening? We should all aspire to be lifelong learners. Maya Angelou says, when you learn, teach. When you get, give. So what is so offensive about the act of mansplaining? Do gender and power dynamics play a role? Are men just trying to teach? Are women overreacting? Aren't some women bossy too? But then again, why are men never described as bossy? What is happening and how is the internet playing a role? On our show today, we have international jet setting photographer, Gregory Schell. Hey. His mysterious associate, Kenzie. We will soon be joined by linguist, Caitlin O'Connell from Lingua Bishes. On the panel with me is Lori Roggenkamp. Hello. All right, let's, let's dig in. The Google Dictionary defines mansplaining like this. Mansplain, verb, informal. When a man explains something to someone, typically a woman, in a manner regarded as condescending or patronizing. So uh, we're going to use it in a sentence. I'm listening to a guy mansplain economics to his wife. The origin of the word is English, and it derives from a combination of the words man and explain. So that's the dictionary dictionary. And then, Lori, I'm going to need for you to read the urban dictionary definition. It is quite different. Stating accurate, verifiable facts, especially when the facts are inconvenient to the feminist worldview or contradict feminist talking points, is often used by a feminist who makes an incorrect claim in support of their narrative and someone who responds with something refuting the feminist claim, which she usually, usually it's a she, cannot counter. By claiming mansplaining, she tries to pretend to have invalidated her opponent's claim even though she has not addressed it at all. So Urban Dictionary is, um, is user-created and the popular definitions will rise to the top. So it would appear that Urban Dictionary is mansplaining the definition of mansplaining. Huh. And Lane, if you want to scroll down the page, you'll see the top six results are the ones that we see and they all take a similar tone. <laughs> so Lane, maybe you can uh, read from the assortment of snarky definitions. Yeah, so we got... A, wor a word used by feminists to silence men and prevent them from learning that men actually have problems too and their point of view isn't the only one. <laughs> okay. uh, <laughs> wow. Buzzword, that means explained by a man because apparently everything needs to be gendered, doing the opposite of promoting gender equality. <laughs> a mis misandrist term for a man making too much sense, usually <laughs> used by feminists to dismiss anything a man says that makes them look bad or stupid. All right. So why do you think that men have a stranglehold on Urban Dictionary? Well, first of all, uh, can I, Greg, explain something yes, right, right on the outset? Please. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, the, the thing I would like to uh, say right off the top is that uh, I think it's important to open up this entire conversation as to whether we believe all, collectively whether mansplaining is an actual thing or whether it's a social construct that someone brought up in 2008 and a lot of people just kind of jumped on it and said yes, and then all of a sudden it evolved to other things like cis-splaining, white-splaining, rich-splaining. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get at the very, very base of whether it's an actual thing or whether we are just people are just taking little bits of a concept and kind of creating something out of the ether. Well, we all know that we can post something on the internet and have no one care, right? Because we've all done that. Like, oh, I thought my puppy looked really cute in that hat, but I guess not. So this took off. So it must have been resonating with people. Kenzie? Yeah. Sure. When you say it took off mansplaining or the Urban Dictionary faction that sort of caused the alternative? Man, the to, whole conversation right. took off. Right. Well, I think in general, a great way to gather followers and influence others is to unify them around some attack coming coming their way and so by tapping into uh you know years and years of legitimate um sexism where f females and, and feminists have felt oppressed and in many cases rightly so using that term can ga galvanize them even in 2018 even after all this progress to say hey go follow this leader or the speaker or go buy this book or vote for this person even irrespective of whether it's legitimate in the case. But I think people have to resonate with it to yeah. a certain extent, right, Lori? I think that it's I think it's been blown up, but I think for I see I I'm interested when I was reading that line, I'm interested to know the the beginnings of it cuz for me what I used to see around was was when Twitter was 140 characters and people would post those these really short things 
And you would have other people kind of going underneath and being like, well, you're also not talking about this part of the story or this part. And I remember specifically a woman, it was shared where she was like a, uh, she had like a master's in biology. She was a, a professor in biology and she posted something and a guy was like, well, you're, you also need to know about this. And she's like, yeah, I do know about that, but I'm tweeting it. Like it's 140 characters. I don't have, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was like, he was literally like, he was condescendingly saying that she didn't have all the information when it's like, she's a professor. She knows what she's talking about. And there's also just conversationally, there's a kinder way of, yeah. of sharing that, just saying, oh, good point. And additionally, yeah. and you, know, I, you can validate what, what someone has said and add to it. You don't have to. Exactly. Yeah. I think that, I think the, the for me, the premise of mansplaining comes from not, not men explaining, because I think that that's a little oversimplified, but it's men cutting down what you originally said and saying what they believe to be the correct correcting answer. you yeah. answer. So it's 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 a twofold thing where I do think it's been used way too much. I think that you know anytime a somebody posts something or anytime a a, um, a guy talks, we like oh look at this guy mansplained to me, and it's like well at some point somebody's gonna have to explain something. Like it's yeah. like that's yeah. just the nature of life, and so it's it's a different. I think mansplaining is a different tactic yeah you did ask him how to get to, to the 405 yeah i actually so. have men explain things to me all the time <laughs> and i am very thankful because i don't know a lot yeah. of things but <laughs> yeah. i actually have a, a i found a funny joke on twitter where it says uh this made me laugh which says, uh where do mansplainers get their water from a well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah. the, Guardian, the Guardian helped me better understand uh, what's happening. The term is commonly credited to Rebecca Solnit for her 2008 essay, which became a 2014 book, Men Explain Things to Me. While, Sol while Solnit did not coin the term, the book crystallized the concept and the term was born and quickly spread across social media and pop culture. The splaining suffix has been applied to many situations, white splaining, cis splaining, het splaining, rich splaining. The important thing to note about these words is how they highlight the power differential. The word always describes the act of the person with the most power in the conversation. If it feels like suddenly words like this are more prominent or being thrown around more often, they're not. It's just that a lot of communication is more public than it used to be. So we're able to witness in-group conversations through social media that we haven't been privy to in the past. Joining us via Zoom is Caitlin O'Connell. Are you there, Caitlin? Hi, how are you? Hello. Hi, Caitlin. Thank you Hi. for joining this conversation. Caitlin is a co-founder of Lingua Bishes. Caitlin, what is a lingua bish and how can I become one? Well, obviously, it's a bish who linguas. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> it's a term that my co-bish, Caitlin Wainwright, and I came up with to describe our journey as we try to stay abreast of current linguistics research um, without really having the time to be in school all the time or always read new articles. So we each read an article once a month and post a summary of it. And it's targeted at dishes like us who just want to stay abreast of what's going on in the linguistics world. Okay, so the the two contributors are you and the other Caitlin? Well, she's actually a Caitlin. Oh, a Caitlin. A Caitlin. I'm so, so confused. It's a pretty big difference. Okay, you know? linguistically, oh, wow. that T is critical. That was super offensive. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, can I, uh, Greg, explain one more thing? Of course. Okay. So for people who didn't understand the joke about, well, actually, I think that needs to be sort of explicated a little bit. So the buzzwords from what I've been reading about mansplaining is when someone says, well, actually, that's a very condescending way of responding to someone, right? Mm -hmm. So when someone's, it can be anyone, male or female, if they're saying like, oh, you know, Heineken's a great beer and someone go, well, actually it's a macro beer and it's kind of cheap tasting and it's not very good. Right. It's so, like, I heard what you just said and now I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. You had it, that locked and loaded, oh, by the way, about that beer. <laughs> well, it's a beer staring at me. So that was my first like way to go. But yeah, but so, well, actually, I think the reason why that joke is the joke is because those seem to be the hot button words that sends everybody off into this like delirium of like, well, actually what, what are you talking about? I know my stuff, you know? So, yeah. uh, but I it's just, because yeah. it's a way to, uh, it, it comes across as you are about to devalue what I just contributed and no, Correct. and everyone wants to be validated. So, yeah. yeah. I don't, can yeah. Caitlin tell us a little bit about, Caitlin. um, why those, those two words in particular are so, have so much power. 
Yeah, there's a great linguist called Jenna Barkes Liechtenstein, and she writes a blog called Everyday Linguistic Anthropology. And she disseminated the well actually phenomenon pretty well in um, a blog post where she talks about how well actually signifies that you're about to say something that's opposite of what you'd expect. So if I say, oh, can you come to dinner on Friday night? And your friend says, well, they don't want to say no, but they're going to say something unexpected. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the use of actually is actually a very confrontational word. And it signifies that you're about to really go off the rails. So those two compounded, uh, well, actually, is quite confrontational. Mm. See, when I say no to dinner, I usually like to pretend like I'm really excited and then whisper my reason. So I go, yeah. why I can't go? I go, oh, my God, I'd love to, but I can't because I have school. <laughs> yeah. And so then That's it's good. like they think that I'm going to go. That's so, so feminine of you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I have a, good. I have a question. I got, uh, <laughs> not to be so weird about that. I recently got in an argument with my father. Um, and he was basically just like, he was basically just like, I think that he made a very o overarching argument where he said that I think a lot of times words get put, women put context to words that aren't need that they don't, ex they don't need that context. So it's like, I, if I say something, if I say, well, actually, it, you're putting the context that it's negative. I'm not putting well, the context. Well, I argue there. against that because there's actually a great body of linguistics research that says that's not the case. Could you it's start the, the sentence with Bill Roggenkamp? The yeah, right. <laughs> she wants you to say this to her father by beginning uh -huh. with Bill Roggenkamp, comma, yeah, yeah. actually. <laughs> Actually, I'd love to, but I'm still dealing with my own dad's explanation of situations. So I oh, boy. Dad's explanation. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, Caitlin, you compiled for us a, a reading list. Can you kind of summarize what one would learn or gain from um, going into this research? Because uh, this is a, a multi layered, multifaceted conversation that's about so much more than language. Oh, yeah, I agree. There's so much out there, too. I found a lot of interesting research that supports not just the language use, but the gender dynamics and the power dynamics. Um, but if you're interested, then you have to read the initial essay, um, which is mainly anecdotal. But I think one of the reasons which you guys were addressing earlier, why it hit off the ground running, why it became such a popular term so quickly, is because before she wrote this piece, we all thought, oh, um, I'm being talked over by this man because my thoughts are not worthwhile, or, you know, maybe I am an idiot, or maybe, you know, all the men just think that I'm stupid. But after she wrote it down, we all said, okay, wait, we're not alone. This is happening to everybody. And it was just a great sort of opening up point for the conversation. Yes, because, um, you know, when we, when we interact with the world, it informs us as to how to interact with the world. So it, it can really stunt someone's participation when they have had these an experience that that tells them maybe don't say anything. So that the next the next time they don't they don't say anything and then on their way home they're thinking, I should have said a thing. And and so everyone's just a little bit frightened because they may have a lot to add. And if they had said that thing, maybe they would have learned something else because it would have sparked an idea in someone else. And like Greg was talking to us before the show about how Ken Burns asked him in the edit bay, like, what do you think? And, you know, yeah. and so now you feel like, oh, well, Ken Burns wanted to know what I thought. And so that means my ideas are valid. So when a woman is talked over or well, actually, then maybe maybe the Vietnam documentary would have been completely different because she wouldn't have said to Ken Burns, hey, why don't you reverse it? Right. Because she doesn't she has felt in the past that what what she thinks or that her ideas are not um are not valid so it it's an exponential problem in either direction based on how we feel about what we have to add i had a question for Kayla. really yeah. early too with, um with from a kids. very young age there's a huge body of research from classroom studies that show that boys who speak out of turn you know answering a teacher without raising their hand are frequently rewarded for being brave or you know bold where women, uh, girls who do the same thing are more often punished for speaking out of turn. So it's uh, information we receive about the social world around us from a very, very young age. It's not 
one man talking down one woman. It's a systemic problem. Right. Can I ask Kaylin a question? Yes. So, Kaylin, do you think that in most uh, instances of mansplaining, and I'm using it as a, a gender, non-gender specific, just if anyone is condescending yeah. to somebody else, do you think that they're doing it consciously or do you think that's a subconscious or unconscious thing that someone's doing when they're mansplaining? My guess is it's usually unconscious because people who are mansplaining have been rewarded for that behavior for so long and they just do it out of habit. Mm. And aren't there certain personalities that just mansplain everyone, men, women, dogs, kids? Babies. They just think yeah. they know like Trump is a good example. What makes that guy think he knows anything? Like that guy knows the least amount of oh, things. He has the best words. <laughs> but he <laughs> says the, the most amount of yeah. things when he has no idea what he's talking about. And and my grandfather was the same way. Like he once tried to tell a professional tennis player how to swing the racket. I'm yeah. like, what? You... He's been rewarded for that behavior in the past. That's why he does it. You don't Whereas think he just he really he knows? probably be told she's being bossy or bitchy or rude. But we value that quality in men. We look, women also look for that quality in men. We want to see them acting that way and we reward it. Even if they're clueless. Oh yeah, I mean, look at the president. I mean, it, it's more confidence-based. I, I, I feel like a lot of times it's fake it till you make it. So I think men especially are taught to sort of, you know, when I was growing up, my dad used to tell my brother to con to just say that he if he applied for a job that said you needed to be able to know how to ride a forklift, just say you can do it and mm -hmm. you'll learn how to do it. For me, he was always just like, just play to your strengths. <laughs> like, he was never like... So he gave you two different advice. Yeah, he never was like... But for my brother, he was always like, just say you can do it and you'll figure it out. Because I think men have that leeway. They're allowed to be able to sort of like... You always hear that story of like somebody who like, you know, doesn't know the job and then in like a day they get like a bunch of books and they've learned the basics of their job or something like that. And that's like, it's like a story of like, you know, I buckled down and I studied and now I'm like, you know, the CEO of a company or mm -hmm. something like that. But, but you rarely hear that about women who are, do, who do that because they're not promoted to do that. They're taught to be like. No, if you don't know how to do it, if you are caught lying, that's lying. Like, that's not being, you know, confident. That's just plain out just lying. Whenever cheating. I think about the man's, the whole, like, m mansplaining concept, <clears throat> um, if I think about it for a while, it's hard for me not to eventually start thinking about imposter syndrome in women, yeah. which is, I think, kind of connected in the sense that it's another way that women, you know, reflect a lack of confidence in their professional lives yeah okay define uh, impo so yeah. imposters i don't know caitlin i don't know if you want to take this one sure i mean i don't have a definition um on hand but it's actually a phenomenon that occurs for everybody and it's when you achieve some modicum of success and all of a sudden wonder if everybody knows that you don't deserve that success and everyone knows that you have your own weaknesses too and they're going to find me out one of these days i'm just an imposter yeah it's i'm really not really supposed to have this podcast yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. She's always constantly asking, "Am I doing all right? Am I? <laughs> Are we this smart?" Um, I have a, I have a question. How do you like stop yourself from that? Because you said it was unconscious. So how do you stop yourself, or or maybe even correct somebody else without being condescending or or sort of, you know, abrupt and to to like help see help them see and acknowledge that what they're doing is you know condescending in a way and not necessarily say mansplaining but just letting them know hey you know you don't have to say it that way or something how do you say that in like a, a you mean like appropriate setting? you mean like dad comma yeah, 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 like yeah. That. or actually i meant for myself because i i work as a, a special ed aide and i do notice that you know and i've done this where you were saying the thing about how or sorry uh caitlin was saying the thing about how men are yeah, uh, boys in school are are you know allowed to sort of shout out answers and girls aren't, and that immediately flipped me to like a couple weeks ago when, um, you know this we had this kid in class who just talks 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 all the time, and you know, and then this other this other girl she rarely ever talks because she has severe anxiety, but she was like like laughing really loud, and I was like, hey, you know just let's keep the noise down. And so now I feel really bad because I felt like, feel like now, like I was telling her, you can't say anything. You can't make noise. This other boy can, he can talk as much as he wants, but you can't make noise. So I like that kind of stuff kind of 
makes me feel, feel like I'm not necessarily being part of the solution, but more part of the problem. Yeah, well, self-awareness is key. That's the first step. If you've noticed that you've done something like that, maybe have a conversation with her. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, mm -hmm. the fact that you, you got in your car and you drove away and you were thinking about it, that means that, you know, we're in an ongoing conversation with everyone that we encounter. Yeah. So you can... And we all make mistakes. Yeah, and we all make mistakes. So you can amend that tomorrow because you gave it some thought and now you're more I'd be aware. more yeah. concerned mm -hmm. about you if you said, oh, I've never done that before. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not right. someone who mansplains. That's, that's a true. Problem. Yeah, because that's true. So for me, yeah, right like, we can all do it. like mansplaining for me, it's like the confluence of ignorance and arrogance. And, mm. and, yeah, and, and that describes a lot of people. And it describes a yeah. ton of people. And maybe mm -hmm. that's insecurity. And that's just how their insecurity mm -hmm. exhibits itself. Yeah. And some people right. just kind of like fade into fair. the background. Yeah. And other people are like, if I'm just the one saying that I know, you know, the best kind of nuclear submarine, then everyone will think I know things. But I, yeah, yeah I, also, I also think that um, sometimes you have to like be careful because there's that thin line between like mansplaining mm -hmm. and just having a healthy discourse with someone. Right. If I happen Definitely. to know, yeah, if I happen to know a lot about, you know, documentaries or making documentaries and I'm talking to Ken Burns, mm -hmm. okay. That, which, which you've done. Which I've done. <laughs> uh, I, you know. Name drop. <laughs> sorry, name drop. Uh, <laughs> uh, drop splain. But, he, <laughs> but, but Ken Burns, I never felt like he was mansplaining anything to me I felt like we were just having a very like healthy discourse, someone who was at a loftier level, even though he was explaining things to me about how his marketing works or how his mm -hmm. creative process works. So that was an example of where we were just having sort of a healthy sort of well, I think if, you, if you're self-aware enough to wonder if you've ever mansplained, I think the thing to do would be to ask a question, to just stop talking for a moment and ask a question. That's the that's the best way to kind of let someone know I really am interested in what you think. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to bring in another hot button word here, but it really does come down to consent because a teacher goes into a room where a bunch of people have signed up with pens and paper and they're there and they're mm. ready to learn. They asked the question. Mm -hmm. If you find you're talking and you haven't assessed whether the listener is aware of that topic already, then you're not a good teacher. Mm. A teacher always assesses the knowledge before they start talking. So I you see. need to ask for consent. Do you want to hear this story? Do you want me to continue talking on this subject? Do you want to change the subject? It really just comes down to an actual two-way, three-way conversation. It's what not I a call lecture. read the room. Yeah. If you're entering a conversation talking, that's probably not a good thing. <laughs> Unless it says in your stage notes, enter talking. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. So I, I thought a good place to go for... Uh, examples of mansplaining was Quora because Quora is great yeah. right and so has everyone been to Quora I it's like it's, you've been there yeah it's like a social network built around asking questions and like yeah. and it's the same as Urban Dictionary and Reddit I guess the the best answers pop up to the top so example one is from Ray Williams go ahead Greg okay example one is from Ray Williams I was on a bachelorette hike on the Appalachian Trail with my friend before her wedding we were having a glorious time nature mountains Glorious Maine. Gorgeous. Then we met a guy. For those of you who don't know anything about the Appalachian trail hiking, <laughs> like yours truly, people often get trail names. He was Turtle Muncher, apparently because he had killed and eaten a turtle at some point. Strong start. He asked us a few questions, and I end up telling him that I live in Dalian, China. He goes, oh, in the south of China, right? Me. No, it's pretty far north, actually, by North Korea. Him. Yeah, but North Korea is in the south of China. Just because it is the word north doesn't make it north. Like North Carolina isn't the north, right? It's still the south. That's true. It's beneath the Mason-Dixon line. It is. Uh, <laughs> ugh, sweet baby Jesus. What follows is a 15-minute discussion on where he continuously tells me I don't know where I live. This dumbass turtle-eating motherfucker thinks that he knows China better than I do. And that he knows where I live better than I do. Now, Ray, you might say, just because he's a dumbass doesn't make mansplaining. He probably does this to everyone. Hold your horses. As I'm standing here with my friend having the most annoying conversation I've ever had, two more hikers join us, a guy and a girl. They say, hey, and we all start talking. The topic comes up again, and I say, I live in Dalian, China. New guy. 
Oh, I know that city. It's in one of the northern provinces, right? Me. Yes. Turtle killer. Huh. I guess it is. <laughs> End of story. End All right. Story. Hand this to uh, Kenzie because he's going to read the next one. Okay. So the reason I like that example, Caitlin, was because it wasn't just that he does this to everyone. As soon as a guy uh, confirmed that her city is in the north, he went, yeah, I guess it is. So that seemed like a pristine example of someone that wasn't ready to believe what a woman was telling him. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. Yeah. But, I've had that. I've had those instances where you? it's like you, you just have like, uh, especially with teenage boys, Ugh, teenage boys are, they make me happy. I'm a lesbian. Um, ah. so I, uh, but they, some teenage boys just for whatever is just their programming but they just don't trust women when they give them the answer so especially are you talking about at school where you at school you, yeah no i'm not just like following teenage boys around and no but it, I, I think that's yeah. interesting because you 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 even have sort of the title yeah of the person who's in charge of them for this period of time and they still don't want to believe what you've said yeah and it's it's kind of the point now where i just uh, what's funny is Literally, I had to stop myself because when you said, oh, am I going to read this whole thing? I was like, it's not an argument. You're doing it. Like, no, right. Literally, which is what I have to oh. say to all of my students. I was like, it's not an argument. You're doing it. I like, like that. You're yeah. the best teacher ever. <laughs> yeah. Because I just have to like, ar I'm just so tired of them arguing with me about it. But yeah. Would you like to read example two, Kenzie? I'd like to ask a question about this last one. Yes, please. Um, what is it that tells us that the, the conversation had to do with her being female? I mean, if if it was a male, would it have been better believed? Do we have any reason to think? No, it's just that when a guy walked up and he knew where her city was and said that's in the north, then the original guy, who right. she calls Turtle Cruncher, whatever, then he's like, oh, yeah, I guess it is. In other words, he but wasn't- I think it's a good point to make. Mansplaining yeah. doesn't just happen to women. Right. It happens yeah. to mainly to non-men and be mm -hmm. they women or other, but- mm -hmm. Men I mean, there's, can be the victims of mansplaining. There's anytime. women splaining, right? I mean, isn't there examples of wi women splaining? Yeah, no. We'll, we'll explain the power the power dynamic, uh, Caitlin, because I think that's an important factor in this conversation. I think yeah, so too. it's really important to consider the power dynamic because um, the oppressed cannot be the splainer. It's not in the definition of splaining. Splaining is um, a form of verbal bullying and. The oppressed just isn't going to be the bullier. But what mm. if you're in that marriage where they use the term henpecked to des to describe what's happening That's to you? What super it sexist. If you don't like your wife, don't be married to her. Okay. <laughs> wow. All right. If, Best advice. Isn't that yeah. like, isn't that, isn't uh, oppressed considered, I mean, the overarching thing is that men are usually the oppressors and, you know, non-men are the oppressed, but... Isn't it like in, it would depend on the dynamic of, of the relationship? There could be, you know, um, a man who's, you know, in in an oppressed relationship or or he's the oppressor. He's the one who's being oppressed in the situation. Okay. okay. Maybe we could yeah. construct a situation where that could be the case. Yes. But then we wouldn't really be talking about the general idea anymore, would we? So, Caitlin, a different it's, idea. Okay. Yeah, it's my understanding that <clears throat> to explain has to have that power and balance. And like the situation that Lori, for example, is describing this mystical is just, situation that's like right, on a nearby is, planet. could just be like an example of abuse because it's like an individual thing mm -hmm. and doesn't reflect like a larger systemic issue. Would that be? Yeah, well put. Well Maybe put. he just has injuries that he can't explain. Maybe that's. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he fell down the stairs. Yeah, he fell on the stairs. He's so well, clumsy. But I, I felt like when I worked in television long, long time ago, when I was an underling, you know, a, tr a you know, writer's assistant, mm -hmm. I had uh, female bosses, you know, that were women explaining to me all the time, and I just thought like, well. This is the what They're I have to take because well, I'm the underling. Well, actually, they were, they were mansplaining. They did were you just you. say well, I actually? I did just well, actually, yeah. Oh, my God. I just realized but, that. Kate, Caitlin, Caitlin, let me know if I have this. They were boss-splaining. There was a power di differential, but it wasn't because of gender. It was because they were your boss. Is that correct? Okay, that's a good question. A, yeah. Now, Got it. I have a question for you, which is, ha, did men ever, did male bosses ever do that? Did you ever notice that with male bosses? Well, what's interesting, that's a very interesting question because I felt like I was treated more fairly by my male bosses. Really? Than I was by my female bosses. And maybe it's because they finally got to a position where they could now kind of 
you know, splain to a male, I mean, or a younger uh, subordinate. Possibly. Or you mean could the it women. be that when a woman speaks with authority, it's more offensive to our sensibilities mm. because we think that Possible. women should be quiet? I, I, you know, yeah, I mean, that's it's t entirely fair to uh, say that because or it could be the fact that, you know, maybe just the particular women that I was under at the time were kind of these sort of like uh, very affected, power hungry kind of producer types that were constantly getting on all of the. And, and by the way, I wasn't the only one getting boss blamed. It was the females as well. Mm -hmm. I had a female boss who was like that. And for a very long time, I wondered if maybe, like, I was like, do I just think women are like this? But then sh then I then I ran into a co-worker, and she informed me that she had a very serious meth addiction. So I was like, I think it might have been the meth. Right. Yeah. Um, she was meth-splaining. Well, in that case, it's probably the meth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she was terrible. She was, like, really bad. And I was just like, she was one of those bosses who you just are like, it was like right when I started the workforce and I was like, oh my God, if you know, when you like get bit by like a, a certain type of dog, you're just afraid of do that dog mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. Like for a while, I was just like, I never want a female boss. You've just, you've just compared a female to a dog. Well, Ooh. I'm a woman, so it's not as bad. Dog explaining. <laughs> I don't know how you're going to explain this. Dog explain. Uh, I, um, I, but can I just say one last thing? So I would um, love to what, hear some dog explaining. That's yeah. something I would sit all day and listen to. What? Oh, have what? you ever seen a dog try and explain something to you? It is annoying. <laughs> like what? Timmy's in the what? Yeah. <laughs> like okay. Actually, what what Kaylin just said though uh, made me think. Um, it, it's a very good point what she said because maybe in in like thinking back on it, you know, doing my sort of like meta history on it, I sort of realized that maybe these female producers who were in a very high level, you know, they had to control these shows, these TV shows. Maybe because we live in a society where those behavioral dynamics are in play. They have to be assertive. They have to seem somewhat authoritative or otherwise they never get taken seriously. Yeah. And so maybe boss planning is an important part uh, for those particular women at the time when I had my experiences. Uh, well, it, it could be like the military where there's like a chain of command and we can't really question what we've been asked to do or everything falls apart here. We just uh, everyone has to just march in in the same direction or we're not going to get this right. show done on time. That, so it, it that's true. It could yeah. have been that. Can you read the next example? Yeah, you bet. Kenzie. Sure. I went to buy a copy of a Bertrand Russell book uh, in parens. Russell is a philosopher. I'm a PhD student in philosophy at a thrift store, along with a few other things. I walked up to the counter holding these books. The cashier looked at them and then proceeded to tell my husband, who was standing nearby dicking off his phone because it wasn't his purchase, what great taste he had in books and how much he really liked that Russell work and asked him a question about it. This was despite the fact that the books were in my hands. I was paying, husband wasn't paying attention, etc. The guy just assumed only a man would be reading these books. My husband, confused, told him he was wrong and that the Russell book was mine. The cashier said, oh, and then proceeded to ask me if I even knew who Russell was and explained to me, unasked, the gist of the book I had picked up and other things he thought I should know about Russell. All that condescending explanation just because I was a woman completely different from the way he was talking to my husband as if it could be assumed they were both on an intellectual footing just by virtue of their gender. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that, that's her interpretation of what happened and we can't really question it if it happened to her. Like what, what would make someone assume that women aren't interested in philosophy? I don't really understand that. Also aren't philosophers supposed to be like super enlightened and yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's I mean, academia is one of the worst cases of mansplaining. Really? No one in academia assumes women are going to be interested in or excel at any of the topics. I'm surprised that you're surprised <laughs> that someone mm. would doubt whether a woman would be interested in philosophy. Oh, that was more of a joke. But yeah, no, no I, 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 I am. Think, I, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that the person holding the book isn't assumed to be the person interested in this subject. I find that very confusing. I've yeah. never encountered that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know why. I that blows my mind. I I was listening to another podcast. I'm sorry, but um, on the way here, um, but it was about a murder that happened in in the 80s, and it was a horrific murder. And this woman was flown. Uh, she was a um, forensic tech, and she was flown from England to China to uh to investigate and they literally turned her away because they said that it was too gruesome for a woman 
<laughs> to do the murder. Oh my and God. to me, I just thought that was so crazy because it was like you literally flew her out for this scene and then you, you decide that it's too... It's, so, I mean, it was like... It, it was a weird sort of like indignation where it's like, let her see the dead body. Like, well, yeah. how much of this though is men trying to protect women or is some sort of instinct playing in that we don't really have a lot of control over because it's just the way we're wired? I think it's just the way that you're taught that men and women are. When I, when I grew up, I used to hang out with this family and they had three boys and two girls. And the boys would play. Uh, my brother would play with the boys, and I always play with the girls. And you can never, I can never play with the boys. Like they were like, the boys will play with their, they'll mm. do their thing. The girls will do their thing. And the girls, we always had to do something like house, or we had to do something, you know, super girly. And the boys would do like they'd be outside, like wrestling in the mud, or something very gay. And so I was just like, <laughs> you know, like I want to go out there and and do that. I want to, you know, I want to be out there and having fun. And like I remember my brother like literally arguing, like, no, 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 she's cool, she's like a boy, for me to go out there and play. Yeah. And it's just like, so I think I think it's just the ideal of like, you know, women like. Girl, there are girly things and then there are manly things and like you know those thing, two things don't cross so I, I just think that that's how some people are raised and those things are also have different value like girly things have less value than yeah boily things <laughs> boilies um, I don't know if it's less value because if one of the girly things is cooking boys like to eat so yeah but cooking is but, usually a, like a woman's responsibility and it's done in the home unpaid so the people appreciate and professionally it's dominated by men yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it should I'm not saying that it, it doesn't have value mm -hmm. it should mm -hmm. cooking and child care and all the stuff that's associated with women should absolutely have more value than it does but that's the perception. I yeah. actually, I have a quick question for Caitlin. I'm wondering if, um, since you were talking about academia, if you think that there's an element of men kind of wanting to hold on to like knowledge and information as like a way to maintain their their power or control in in society, if that's like mm. something to do with it. I would hesitate to put such a deliberate sort of intention on the whole thing. Right. Uh, I think it's less to do with that and more to do with socialization. So men uh, want to be around more men. So when there's a grad student that they like, it's probably going to be a man who, you know, played a sport that they did or liked the same books that they did or whatever it is. And they tap that person to be their mentor and to guide them. They don't question them so harshly. I mean, there's a lot of evidence of um, women giving dissertations or other academic presentations and just basically being dismissed off stage mm. for small details, for word choice, for, you know, nothing substantial that are not considered at all when a man does a presentation. And I, mm -hmm. I don't think that there's something usually deliberately malicious about it. I hope that we are all moving into, I hope we're all evolving as a society. I hope, I hope so. Because right now, I find it very strange whenever they say like, oh, the first female uh, referee for an NFL game. You know, this is a story I just read and they're making a big deal. And it was wonderful that they had the very first female referee that was out on the football field, actually, you know, throwing the flag and being with all the guys. Mm -hmm. And so I hope what's happening is that we're moving as we move forward in the future, that eventually that's not going to be a news story, that it's going to yeah. be you know, it'll be equality across the board, right? right. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I'm imagining like before civil rights, these kinds of stories were happening when African-Americans first got <laughs> their chance to vote or their yeah. first chance well, or whatever. So as we move forward, maybe the whole mansplaining thing will just kind of go away. Well, you say I equality hope. stuff, but I would just like for women to be represented individually as themselves. I mean, there was a couple years ago when they were saying like George Clooney's wife Who's like this renowned lawyer? Right, right. And like, yeah, yeah. it's like, it, it, and it was just like, can you just address her? Or recently, very recently, they said uh, the singer Jesse J did a um, uh, interview because she uh, had found out that she was like something was wrong where she couldn't have children or something like that, mm -hmm. and she cr is now recently dating Channing Tatum. And People Magazine had their heading was Channing Tatum's new girlfriend 
says she will not let this new health no, thing. No, but they're going to defer to the more famous person. I don't think mm. that sexism. Jesse J's super famous. Ah, uh, Jesse J is very famous. Yeah, okay. she's 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 been on The Voice. I think. Wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. Channing Tatum and Jenna Dewan aren't together anymore. Uh-oh. This is news. Oh my god! Uh-oh. This is news to me. Oh Uh-oh. my god! We got to oh Okay, we got to totally switch gears right. here, guys. Yeah. We got to break this. Why? Down. What happened? No, Jen. Oh god. No. Okay. Yeah, so, but, no, but to ahead. your point, Amal no, no. Clooney is an amazing human being, and the the fact but, that they kept referring to her as George Clooney. But she's wife. not the movie star. I don't right. think that has to do I agree with. with Louise. Gender. But if she's getting an award, because she was getting no, an award, look, if she's getting we, an award, we then... no longer say California female senator because we've had nothing but female senators for a while. So it's just ah. that's our senator. I do agree with Greg that we're moving forward. I hope so. I th- I think so. I mean I don't, you know what I I I would say probably Caitlin has more of the answer because she she knows more about like the how things are worded. Do you think that we're mo- moving forward? Yeah. You know, change is never as fast as you hope that it is. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But I mean, there's a, so this word that's a 10 year old word now came out and it was a hot topic for women who finally felt like they had a shared experience and a word to describe it. And quickly it got taken over by the trolls uh, who change it into, oh, you think you have a problem? No, men have the problem. <laughs> they just sort of flip it around. Um, but there, I was reading a study that was conducted last year uh, in the fall, or no, sorry, it was conducted in 2016 in the fall, um, where they looked at 200 tweets and the use of the word in the tweets. And now it's being used more of uh, as a joke. So um, it's a way to step away from the sense of bullying and the abuse and condescension and to start a talking point about the way we talk to each other. And I think that's a really good sign for the word and for the way we talk to each other, that we now have this tool for initiating conversation about consent and lecturing or uh, not silencing women or non-men. Uh, so I, th- I think it's, it's positive. I think it's too slow for my liking. But... Okay, Lori, would you read example yeah. number three, please? Sure. Example number three by Crystal Lou Puppy Carrier. Care, sorry. My boyfriend at the time dragged me along to a pool lounge. Pool as in the thing with a table, many balls, and a poking stick. Not the empty pit thing filled with wet stuff. (laughs) Where he was meeting his friends one night. All the guys were getting competitive, trying trick shots, and trying to determine the overall best player. While all that was happening, I grabbed a drink from the bar and contented myself with chatting and getting to know some of the people I hadn't met before who weren't in the middle of an intense... My muscles are bigger than yours game. After a while, one of my boyfriend's mates, for the sake of this story, let's call him Jimmy, who was getting incredibly frustrated with losing, came up to me and said, Crystal, you're a girl. Want a game? I want to win a game for once. If he had simply asked for a game, I probably would have said no because I was enjoying my conversation at the time. But the fact that he straight up assumed he would beat me because I was a girl? Oh, hell no. I kept my calm, said I would play, and asked for a cue. Yes, I do know it's called a cue, not a poking stick. Next, Jimmy asked me to pass him ball so he could help. He could set up for me. As I was rolling ball after ball to him, he explained where each one should go in the triangle in detail. (laughs) Once set up, he graciously and ever so kindly offered to break for me so I wouldn't have to. After his break, he didn't get any in. Jimmy said to me, all right, so you need to make sure your stick is poking in the direction you want the ball to go. (laughs) There's not many easy options right now, but I reckon if you hit the closest ball right about here, you could get close. I nodded curtly and lined up my shot. I aimed so that I would miss the ball. He advised by about a centimeter and drew back the cue. Just as he tried to verbally correct the angle, as I knew he would, I took my shot. The white ball flew past the one he intended, rebounded off the cushion, and knocked a different ball, the one I intended all along, into a pocket. Oh, my God, that was so lucky. Nice. Have another shot, Jimmy urged. (laughs) It wasn't until I sunk the fifth ball in a roll that old mate Jimmy began to realize that the first shot wasn't a complete fluke. His face contorted into a mixture of shock, horror, and embarrassment as I completely cleared the table by my third turn. That is mansplaining. Okay, now I have a question about that specific story. Why couldn't that person, I'm just, you know, as a hypothetical, why couldn't that female stop the guy at the beginning when she already sees he's starting to man coach, mansplain, whatever you want to call Mm -hmm. this pool lesson. Mm -hmm. And she's like, guy, back off. 
watch me. Boom, yeah. boom, boom, boom. I mean, she that's could've... the solution, right? But if you're a shy person or you don't feel like you're, you know, like me, you know, able to say, like, get away from me, like, don't try and, you know, micromanage my pool playing. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to throw that in as like, OK, well, that's an alternative way of looking at this story. She could have easily I don't think, said. I don't think that the onus should be on the mansplainy to do that, to like have to address the like behavior the moment of the he mansplainer. said, I'm tired of losing. I'm going to use you in this fashion. Yeah. That was when she just checked out and said, I'm going to wipe the table. No with offense, you. but I just yeah. think it's funny that you mansplained her mansplain moment. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> you're like, I think there could have been a better way. Palanker uh, splain. No, and I, that's the whole fun of this conversation. Is I would that, have right. uh, I would have shot a pool cue right into his testicles. I would have, that's what I would have done. That's perfect. I would yeah. have been like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. And then just kept doing it. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I, I think that you have that moment where you're just like, you're just like, you know what? I'm just, I'm tired. Cause it's just like, there's just level of just exhaustion that comes with consistently having to deal with that on a daily basis. And it's just the little things. And so, I mean, I think that when you, when it ha when it's that overt, like when she said, when you said she just checked out, she was just like, you know what? I'm just done. The fact that like, it didn't even occur to him that that was a bad thing to say. Or that she might be good at pool. Yeah. That also didn't occur to him. Yeah. And, and then, don't forget that if she had spoken up, mm -hmm. she might have been causing permanent damage to a relationship with um, her boyfriend, one of her boyfriend's good friends. Because if a woman speaks up and is assertive, she's called bossy or bitchy. And that mm -hmm. might have been a long term problem. She has to deal with it every, you know, potluck dinner or whatever whenever or, they hang out again in the future. Or if the girl had spoken up and said, actually, these these books are for me. I'm buying these philosopher books in the earlier example we used. Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing. If she had spoken up and told the person at the register, actually, these are for me. You don't have to talk to him anymore. She'll seem what bossy bitch. or bitch. Yeah, right. They'll, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, right. but, but, so, okay, so then this begs the question. So what is the answer then? So is the answer to speak up when this happens? Or is the answer to just be like, Whatever, and I'm just going to do my thing. I mean, I think it depends on your personality. I would use humor. I would have used humor and just said, what makes you think I'm not really good at pool? You know, you better know what you're getting up to here, buddy. Yeah. I mean, I just right. would have used my humor because that's my style. We all have different styles. But the answer isn't for the victim. The answer is for the perpetrators and the friends of the victim. I know, but you're mm. assuming we're never going to run into this guy. And so right. we're you just, will. yeah, meet that guy. we're giving advice to people that are going to run into this guy, even though it, you know, ideally we'd like to correct that behavior, but just life being what it is, we're going to run into that guy. Right. And so Caitlin, what do you advise? I would say, talk to your friends, talk to your colleagues, talk to everyone about it and say what you would like to see in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also lead by example. If mm -hmm. you see someone being blamed, see someone being blamed at, step in intervene. and support the victim don't yeah. support the perpetrator intervene right. it's like the bully you know like the bystander stops the bully so it is a form of bullying it is right yeah, yeah. all right we have the number one list of the week from Bu this one uh this week is from bustle i think it also often comes from bustle right dina they're good at lists um these are six subtle forms of mansplaining that women encounter daily and not, like this list is interesting because i didn't know that number six i didn't know that that was mansplaining but it, uh, apparently it is um, being catcalled or told to smile as you're walking down the street. So if you if, if you describe mansplaining as a man deciding that he knows better than you what's best for you, then this is just a man passing you on the street and deciding what your face should be doing. <laughs> and that, I guess, yeah. would you define that as mansplaining, Caitlin? Yeah, I mean, it's been defined as a group of behaviors that um, silence and oppress women including manspreading, mansplaining, manterrupting, mammals, all of them. Ooh, manspreading. Mammals That's being the thing all where male panels. people on subways and they like, the guys like open up their legs yeah. to like take up, in, in case people don't know what manspreading is. Yeah, just taking up it's the not most a amount of, spread. it's like, <laughs> it's not, it's not yeah. a very be. oily sandwich. Yeah, I think it's this like, is how much uh, mayo you need on this. <laughs> I think okay? it's like, it's like the <laughs> human man need. version of like peeing on everything. Let me show you how to make the sandwich. Yeah, okay. yeah, let me show you. I'm going to take up as much space as possible. So that I feel like I'm in control of my immediate surroundings. I do okay. feel like there needs to be a version of man spreading that is just men trying to teach you how to spread mayo on. You know, just right. <laughs> mayo that, explaining. I'm now, sure that's out there. Now that somewhere. you've said that, I have several times my dad has been like, you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> the Give me the show you is Spanish. off the chart. Yeah. Give me the bread. Yeah. <laughs> but see, I okay, and I will say, and, and to riff on that, 
I would have no problem if a woman or a man was an Italian chef and I was making a pasta and they wanted to explain to me about making my pasta better. But if you were an award-winning chef and some someone walked in and started telling you how to do something that you knew really well how to do, you'd be like, <sighs> That's true. That's very true. I also think that, I think it's getting a little confused because I think explaining in general, again, is not the issue. It's the condescending nature yeah that's the problem it's the cutting down it's the nullification yeah. of what they've just offered exactly it's right. the nullification of like you don't know it would be different so if it's like let's say somebody came into your restaurant and they were like you know i just i think the i think there needs to be more s sauce in the nude i don't know how to cook um i think there needs to be more you know you need to put something in the thing and then you're like oh okay yeah i do need to do that i need to put more salt in my noodles if that's a thing and then you do it and it's great and you're like hey thank you but if somebody comes into your restaurant and you're like oh i can tell that you're struggling and you don't know what you're doing mm -hmm. let me tell you how to how to cook noodles you'd be well, like what the hell dude it's like hmm. mother-in-law explaining so let's say you yes. you've, you've married a guy and you've set up house you know a, 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 like home, a home together oh. and then his mother comes and starts to tell you how, how to fold the towels. I feel like this is coming from a personal place. Yes. It is not. Oh, okay. My mother-in-law is awesome. Oh, okay. But these are things I've seen on TV. Oh, okay. So what, that's a power dynamic, isn't it, Caitlin? Yeah, it definitely is. But I'd say it's not even experts to non-expert. For example, you know, my husband wants to eat spaghetti with butter and cheese on it. It's his favorite meal. He loves it. Mm -hmm. I constantly come in and spaghetti explain to him because I'm like, oh, let's get... <laughs> Let's get some garlic in there and some onions. Let's throw some herbs. And he doesn't consent to you that. You are blowing my mind right now. Like. Wow. <laughs> and I need to shut up. Yeah. But it's like, but if the yeah. if his mother comes in and she's the person that raised him, you know, up until the point where you met him, she she probably thinks she knows more about this guy than his new wife does. And so that's mm -hmm. sometimes a dynamic. And there's that, a power dynamic there. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I feel like I feel like what you were just saying, the difference between like explaining and explaining, yeah. like like there's there's a certain discourse that happens with the explanation, which is kind of like fair. Yeah. But explaining is definitely like condescending and like treating someone like lesser than. Right. Yeah. And so and I think like with this list, like catcalling or telling someone they should smile to me, that's almost like a different degree of condescension yeah it's you don't like even know the person yeah. like like you're walking yeah. by a stranger and like you should smile that's i mean, I mean that's a, a behavior jerk. like i grew up in new york city and i you know i walked on the streets a lot i took the subway a lot so i've been a victim of you know smile and man spreading and we're like things that i can't say on on the mm -hmm. podcast um and that's a different i think that is a different issue that's more like an assault and, you know, because it makes you feel unsafe. Like, I think if you're being mansplained to, you could potentially feel like, okay, I can say something. Like, I probably won't because it'll be a whole other can of worms. But mm. I can. I think, like, if somebody, usually, if, like, some random guy in the street was like, you should smile. I was like, okay. And I would just, like, smile because, like, who knows? You know, I could be, like, in physical danger. Yeah, you know, if that's a that, good point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, number five is being told what you will or will not like. And that's one I can <laughs> personally relate to. <laughs> Because really? I, have a, I have a cousin that does this. He's a male cousin. And when I go to his city, he, he's like, oh, Wheezy, you're going to love this. And then I hate it. So he has, like, you just said I'm going to love it. So what was what made you think that other than you're going to love it? Like, you yeah. were doing the thing you wanted to do because you're going to love it. So don't tell me I'm going to love it when you're the person. Yeah. That's, Couldn't that be yeah. him trying to incite like excitement in you though? I don't know. It was like we were supposed to have brunch with my with my cousin Jeremy and I wanted to sit down and have brunch. And then I asked this other cousin to come along and he planned out the whole thing and we wound up walking for miles to this like little stand where you buy sandwiches that we were gonna take out to like a bench somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was not what I was gonna love. I wanted brunch. Yeah. So why would you so say he, I'm going to love this when you have no evidence to back that? And he totally went beyond what you were went behind what yeah. you wanted. I think that's just nervous. Like he wants you yeah, to be excited. That's the insecurity. Like, like oh, you're going to love through. this. This is yeah. going to be really awesome. We're going to be right by the lake, and we're going to have a sandwich. And let me tell you how. No, this but he didn't mail, say that in advance. <laughs> he didn't say what it was because then I would have said, <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> I want to right. go somewhere that serves brunch. <laughs> right. But he didn't. He just said, you're going to love this. And then we just started walking. <laughs> I, I also would say like one of the ways that I kind of, I don't know why I started that really loud. I also, <laughs> uh, I, I, I also feel like one of the ways that I sort of go like, is this, 
is this in that realm? Is this is this seen as sort of like sexist or you know something? Uh, is that like it? Would this person do this to a man? Like I would, think he would it, have. If yeah, you I think okay. he, yeah, he would have. Yeah, it had nothing to do with gender. It was just. Yeah, but what about in bars when um, people try and tell you you're going to love some fruity cocktail right. or some wine of yeah. the week, despite the fact that you know your beer and you ask for the beer that you want, and right. they say no, you really got to try this uh, pineapple rum concoction, and um, that's the kind of thing that I would say happens to women more than it does to men. I think you're yeah. right. I think you're right. Number four, being told by a guy that he knows more about women than actual women. So, <laughs> so this was on CNN. This I, oh, I, I've seen we this can't guy play before. it because it yeah. will get blocked by YouTube. But this, go home and watch this. It's so good. I feel like the they hire the- that guy to come on to <laughs> just be like the the ultimate mansplainer because who that's want- what he's like. Okay, who wants to describe what happens in this segment? Because I've been talking too much. Who's seen it and wants to describe it? I've seen it. Okay, great. Okay. I could take... First yeah. of all, the guy is like... He's sort of this handsome guy, and they yeah. always bring him on CNN or CNBC or whatever, and he's always like this total like <laughs> male... Like he speaks for all men. He's you know, dude and He's boy. got this snarky look on his face all the time, and he'll listen to like whatever the female pundit's saying, and then he'll be like, well, actually. <laughs> and he, he will. He, he will start with well, actually, or he'll have some version of well, actually, and he'll go into a mansplain. So what happens is that there was this viral video of the of a woman walking down the street, and she's like catcalled everywhere she goes. Oh, yeah. I yeah, saw that. yeah. And so... Yeah. This female comedian, I, I'm sorry, I, she's lovely, I don't know her name, and then this handsome man are uh, talking about whether or not this is actually true or whether it was mocked or whether this actually happens to women. And then he's telling her why she actually likes it. And she's saying, no, I don't. I don't want strangers telling me anything about my appearance. I'm simply getting from point A to point B. This is not the time period during which my appearance gets validated or needs to be. And I know they're yelling that because they want to have sex with me, not just because they think I'm pretty. So it's it's the opposite of what you think. And then he kept saying, no, women love that. Oh, oh, it's it's so glorious. You just have to watch it. It's like he you know, he's not a woman. No. And he keeps saying women love being complimented. And and that's where I guess it could get confusing for men, because Mm -hmm. women do love being complimented by people they know. Yeah. Right. We don't yeah. want that to be aren't complimented. going to make them feel uncomfortable or scared or make them think about what potential danger awaits there's, them. There's an agenda yeah. behind that compliment that's yeah. dangerous. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's not a compliment. Yeah. Right. yeah. There's yeah. a no. yeah. When you're, yeah. When you're aggressively saying something to a woman, that's usually never. I will say it's. Ne- I'm going to make an assertion. It's never a compliment. It's never a compliment. It's about yeah. them. It's it, yeah. It, it's not about making you feel good about yourself. Yeah. It's thinking maybe she'll just stop what she's doing, and let me get on top of her. Well, <laughs> what's really yeah. funny, what's really funny is there is a video of this woman who did the uh, similar thing, and she would stop and talk to the guys. She would go walk up to the guys and talk I saw to them that too. And the woman <laughs> nine times out of ten, when she would turn around, the guys would be like, "Oh snap!" Like they would be so <laughs> yeah. Afraid. It's like they she called her blu- their bluff. Yeah, she you would know? be so afraid. So it's like it's a it's like a thing about how they they do want it, but it's also like they just want to put that on somebody else. So I just, yeah. Yeah. All right. Number three is when a guy explains the female body to you. Oh, my God. Oh, that's oh, a good geez. one. So this hasn't happened unless it was my gynecologist who does know more about it, maybe. Um, right. Unless you're a doctor. So you when, really should be telling a woman about her own body. So when does Even guy, if you are a doctor. Has anyone had this happen where a guy tells you that he knows more about your body? Is Are we talking no. about like sexually or what are we talking about? I'm assuming sexually. I mean, it doesn't have to be sexually. Okay. It can be, you know, like, I I can't remember an exact instance, but I'm almost positive that my ex-boyfriend probably was like, this is why you can't have an orgasm. Just kidding. No, that's okay. Not, that didn't happen. <laughs> I, that's probably well, happened. It yeah. happens a lot with, when people <laughs> say, like... to that bit was really astounding. <laughs> it happens a lot when females say, like, oh, I'm getting a breast reduction. He's like, babe, you don't. Oh, that the, right, you know, yeah, yeah. Like right. you don't, you don't ruin what God gave you. Yeah, right, okay? right. Yeah, oh, I have yeah, yeah. an example that might happen to my sister. Okay, we were okay. we were on vacation. There was a family friend, and it's like kind of gross, but I won't go into detail. But basically, the gist was this guy was like, "Oh, do you like take showers or baths?" Which is like a weird question to begin with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then she was like, "No, I don't bath because I'm an adult. Like, mm-hmm. what's wrong with you?" 
And he's like, no, you have to do baths for like your vaginal health. Like it's better for you. <laughs> and she was like, what? What? And it's just like this like idea that he's just like, no, like I know, like it's better for. And I was like, dude, you don't have a vagina. Like, <laughs> yeah. What are you talking? Like what study? Are I think you he, he wants like, to be he wants to be able about? to picture her in a bath. That was yeah. about uh, his mental image. Yeah, that's not great to think about. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh! But that's that's one example. I that think. is a good example. I, like, we're, why do you need to say that? What is oh, happening? That is... number two. When a guy explains your field of expertise to you, that kind of yeah. goes back to the stories that's we were like talking the, about. The earlier. origin of mansplaining, right? Right. It happened yeah. to Rebecca Solnit. Right. That's exactly. Solnit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she was up in Aspen, Colorado, right? And she yeah. was talking about this book <laughs> about Edward Moybridge. This, you know, uh, photographer, was very famous, like early uh, photographer who. You don't have to mansplain it to us. We know oh, all about wow. it. No, 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 no. We know he's all actually, about it. He's no. actually okay. just explaining. He's, he's explaining it to our podcast listener. I know. Who yeah. are all women. Well, actually, <laughs> uh, just so people don't know. Yeah. So she wrote this book and she f- finds this guy at this party and he's like, immediately she starts talking about her book and then he almost like over talks her and says, oh, actually, Edward Moybridge. Yeah, there's like this famous book about her, about him, uh, you know, setting up trip wires to show that horses actually have all four legs on the ground, <laughs> off, the when, off the ground when they're running. And she and before she could even realize what this guy was doing, he, she was he was mansplaining. Yeah, because he did. He, it oh, didn't. It didn't occur to him that she could have written the book. He's like, yeah, another book like that just yeah. came. Out. And then her friend is just like, <laughs> I think you're talking about her book. Her book. Yeah, and, and her like, friend had to <laughs> say it like so- a few <laughs> times. Yeah. It, it just, never even occurred to him that he oh, was talking funny. to the author. Yeah, which is so funny. So I was going to ask, um, Kaylin. Is it Kaylin? Kaylin. It's Kay- with okay. a Kaylin. I thought partner. it was Kaylin. Okay. I think the other. <laughs> okay. Uh, Caitlin. Caitlin. Uh, <laughs> do you think that uh, Rebecca Sol- uh, Rebecca Solnit is like sort of the Pied Piper then of this whole mansplaining thing, just like Rachel Carson was sort of the Pied Piper of the environmental movement when she wrote Silent Spring? I just wanted to know, is she really the person that kind of brought it all to the forefront? He, yeah, I would say that. Yeah, okay. I'd say that she yelled the first rallying cry. I mean, she didn't right. invent the word, but it sort of brought it to the forefront of her consciousness for sure. Okay, Although cool. there's evidence of this happening for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm. I read one article where it had something from, I think, Lincoln to his wife where he was mansplaining something to her. Like, this has been going on forever. <laughs> we just didn't talk about it. So I read yeah. a sociology paper in when I was in college. And it was about the dynamics in a hospital. And at that time, most nurses were women and most doctors were men. So usually the nurses would know the best thing for the patient because they were the ones that were around the patient. But they could never mm-hmm. just say to the doctor, he needs this. They always had to like mm-hmm. just hint at it to, until the doctor said it. And there was this art to it. You, you couldn't just say it. It had to be the doctor's idea, but you had to lead him there. Uh, right. Oh, wow. well, the so Solnit yeah. story kind of speaks to so there's been so much of this in the history of like humanity like you know that example Louis is just one of the you know many millions or thousands of times that this has happened but it had to be a PhD right it had to be like a woman who wrote like a dozen books in order for us to be like oh, okay well this is like a worthwhile example yeah and so it has to be somebody who's just as like established, or yeah. like who's even more who's so got like all the credentials, yeah. That yeah. like so that everyone, like men and women included, could be like, oh, well, she has the right to yeah. say well, something. Like about disregard this. her ovaries; she also knows a thing, right? Yeah. I was just, I don't know why I feel like sharing this, but I was just reading this graphic novel that it made me laugh out loud. Uh, it was uh, it's this graphic novel called Preacher, and one of the things is this guy, the sergeant, is like in the middle of his like uh uh fellow officers and he's like if you see a f- a female sergeant immediately shoot her because she has the most knowledge of anybody you will ever meet because she's had to scrape her way from the top so she will know eight ways to kill you mm. without lifting a finger and it's like so i just thought that was so funny that he's like she she literally has more knowledge than all of us and but she's just as you know it's just, yeah, yeah i thought that was great number one is when a guy makes you feel like an outsider yeah, I get so, that a lot. In it's not so much now, but I got that a lot in stand up. In comedy, yeah, that must be like a yeah. huge thing. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like I always felt like, well, I was made a regular at the Laugh Factory, and that's like a really uh, misogynistic place. I maybe it's changing, but at the time, men had the attitude of that if you weren't sleeping with them, you were simply taking up their stage time. 
so you were worthless and they would mm. they would cluster in ways where they were exclude you and guys that were even like really nice guys when they were in that environment that you spoke to in other environments would not speak to you there yeah um and it's just, just really invisible. you were invisible yeah yeah and like one time this guy said to me he's like we like i forget what the conversation was he, he goes like we don't even know if you have a vagina and i'm like is that because no one here has seen it and he's like yes <laughs> I go, well, no one here is going to see it. Yeah. <laughs> but like that, just the idea that they think that they can say that. And yeah. And culturally, everyone else was like, yeah, we don't, we haven't seen it. It took, it took <laughs> a <bizarre>. really, <laughs> yeah. Everybody was like, that's true. We haven't seen it. <laughs> Wait yeah. a second. Now that I'm thinking about it, I've never seen you go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, I had, I it took me a very long time before I started seeing the, the compliment of like, you're so, you're so funny, like a man, or you're just like a male comedian as like, not a compliment. Right. Cause for such a long time, there's still video out there of me. I used to do, uh, uh, stuff with this, this, uh, person uh, who we actually met through Bill Word, oh, who's yeah. like a really great guy. Mm-hmm. And he. Um, he did a lot of stuff in Orange County, and I won Orange County's Funniest Person, first female to do that. <laughs> I'm ranking. She beat uh, me. Uh, um, she beat me twice. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me. <laughs> um, I showed my vagina. Uh, but um, And it's a nice one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so um, I went on. The, they had this like Orange County like public uh, uh, TV show, and I went on with uh, Bill Word. And there's I think there's still video of me literally arguing why they asked the question, why aren't why aren't women funnier? You know, why are there less women in comedy? And I, I actually go like, there just aren't funny women. Like women just don't tell funny jokes or some stupid thing. Mm -hmm. And Bill Ward like actually has like a very like intelligent response. He's like, no, it's a matter of numbers. You know, women are funny. It's just that, you know, there's not a lot out, there's not a lot of representation. And so, and it's just one of those things where it's like, I grew up in that culture. So I was so used to just thinking like, oh yeah, women aren't funny. Most even even now, like I still have like a little bit of a twinge when I see that like it's an all woman show. Even when I'm on it, I'm like, oh okay. But it's still it's great. Like I, but it's just you just grow up in that culture of like women aren't funny without well, a man's help. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is a whole other conversation, but it's yeah. women are not socialized that being funny is a quality that's valued, and so they don't always sharpen yeah. that tool. Yeah. At, at, as kids. But if you're an outcast like I was, you sharpen that tool because you just have to survive. And so that's something that works like, oh, she can be sarcastic. I guess that's going to be in her favor. Maybe yeah. you had a similar experience. But um, uh, I had a I had a, a Mark Marin one time. He was at the improv and he actually like is almost like this setting right here where you're I was there and there was another comedian here. And Mark Marin just sat between us and then moved his chair to not face me. To Aww. talk to the male comedian Aww. and literally was like, I thought you were great. You're funnier than everybody else on the show. And I was almost like, you couldn't have even just said hi to me. Like, it was just so weird how he like almost like intentionally moved mm-hmm. his chair so he wasn't looking at me. Shocking. And it was just simply because I, you know. I used to like you, Mark Marin. Well, I mean, you know, it was, this was around the time he's done a lot. I mean, if you listen to his podcast, 90% of his podcast is just apologies. Maybe so, he's evolving. <laughs> he's yeah. just, you know, this is, this was before pre-apology. So yeah. when a man mansplains something to to a woman, he interrupts or speaks over her to explain something that she already knows. Indeed, something in which she may already be an expert. Mansplaining is not a universal flaw of the gender, just the intersection between overconfidence and cluelessness where some portion of that gender tends to get stuck. Um, so do you have, before we move on to Facebook feed time, which is a feature that we do every week, uh, Caitlin, do you have anything to add to this conversation that we've missed? Um, I guess I'd just like to say that women or non-men often get blamed for not being a part of panels or not being more prominent. And the fact is that the people who get to speak the most and are most prominent are those who are supported. And women are not supported, even by other women. And so it's not a matter of the most assertive person getting the most say. It's about the most supported person getting the most say. Hmm. And I think that's an important hmm. thing to think about going forward. I like that. I really that's, like that. And that's really helpful, too, for all, for all sides of this conversation. Yeah. yeah that's, that's really a, helpful. That's a really helpful point. To, to think about. And also, let's keep in mind, too, that like anyone who mansplains other people are lame. They're just lame. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're insecure. They're know-it-alls. They're lame. Yeah. So, you know... I. I mean, I consider myself somewhat intellectual, but I, I don't mansplain or at least I don't try to mansplain anybody 
because I'm confident. I don't need I to mansplain that. anybody. Yeah, All and that's right. an important point. Like maybe we should try to show some compassion to people who's blind. Yeah, a, maybe a little more. Than, maybe there's that we little do. side of it. Yeah, bit, yeah, maybe just a little bit of empathy or sympathy with someone like, right. oh, you and must not, be suffering from. Not excuse from a... their behavior, but right. you know, yeah. yeah, But you really shouldn't be president any longer. Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. There you go. All right, Facebook feed time comes from okay. Warren Cassell or Castle. I'm not sure why I'm Facebook friends with him because I don't actually know him. Do you know him? Is he a comedian, Lori? Because this was this was funny. He writes, "Nothing is more painful than being blocked on social media by the person you are planning to block." Oh, Oh. that's the worst. (laughs) I've had that that happen to me. It's like a first strike. First strike. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, you got to get in there. You can't break up with me. I'm breaking up with you. (laughs) Yeah, but they block you. You can't fire me. I quit. (laughs) That's happened to me a few times, actually. Oh yeah. (laughs) Or I go to no, I go to message someone and I can't message them because they've blocked me. Yeah. Ah. And I'm like, wait a second. I was ready to like extend you, the olive branch. Do you also message people to let them know you're blocking them? <laughs> I do that too. Oh, oh absolutely. I go over yeah. and tell oh, them. Oh, I, I do that too. Yeah. I send them a whole list of their crimes. For sure, yeah. Like it matters. Yeah. Like now I'm thinking about it. It's so asinine because I'm like, these are the points that you really need to look at. Yeah, I send them you're about to be blocked bouquet. <laughs> yeah, yeah because, because if you just block someone and you just kind of silently fade away, it's not as it's not no. as gratifying. Yeah, remember saying, you this used is to just be able to blocked. hang right. up the phone and it felt like a thing that you've just done exactly and it doesn't now feel it's the like, same when you go like this block on your cell phone i also <laughs> just the same drop as, my phone <laughs> oh, I do yeah. it. <laughs> all right so for what's twitter trending today we had hashtag beatles songs for millennials and i picked three winners okay, okay. Uh, so we have from katie larson uh and she tweets i get by with a little help from my parents ah. <laughs> nice nice <laughs> nice funny. nice from mcmahon of the people we have you up jude Oh, that's uh, good. I like that. I like that one. And from Luke Deft, we have happiness is a warm man bun. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that good. may be the winner. <laughs> I want to thank everyone for being with us and uh, for taking part in this in- entirely enlightening conversation. Oh, sorry. I have yeah. one yeah. more important thing to yes, say. Yes, please. Okay. So Channing Tatum and Jenna Dewan, ah! they separated <laughs> in uh, twenty early 2018. Yeah. Oh, did I, I don't know. All right. That's it. it. All right. So what happened? <laughs> oh, oh, they they said that it was traveling. You know, uh, Channing Tatum was getting yeah. popular. And, traveling. And... Yeah, traveling. And, and they just felt like it was just, they weren't really, uh, they they're still going to be the best together, of friends. Though, don't they? Yeah, they have mm-hmm. a kid together. This makes me sad. I really thought of them they, as like that. There that was one, a little one. bit of a rumor that Channing Tatum was cheating on her. No. You know, as there no, always is. No, he would never do that. No, he, he, would, not, he wouldn't do that. No. But yeah, now he's dating Jesse J. I want to thank Lori Roggenkamp, uh, Gregory Shell, our you. mysterious guest Kenzie, who mysteriously left. Like, it's oh, so yeah. in keeping with his character. Yeah. It is. He was yeah. here, and then a puff of smoke. He was. He's gone. the Banksy yeah. of podcasts. I'm Mystery. telling you. <laughs> uh, Lane McFadden, uh, Francesco Demando, and and Connor so you're, McGlynn. I have to learn his name. Dina Friedman, David Court. Uh, Patricia Bach is here with us today. Yay. Yay. I am Louise Planker. We want to be your new favorite podcast, so please like us and subscribe and tell your friends and join the conversation. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye.